I'm with Lagos Digital Village. It's a non-profit uh, IT project based in Nigeria. And I'm speaking here on behalf of the ITU Youth Leaders and ICTs Network. It's a network of young people from different regions of the world who have attended International Telecoms Union Youth Forum between 2001 and now. Um, there are two or three of us here. Well, I, I, I don't think it's more like my stance. I think it's reality, actually. I mean, what, I mean well, there's a theory that says that there's order in chaos and all that, but I, I believe that considering the pluses and the minuses of the internet, definitely there's already some form of governance. But I think that there's a need for some more collaborative form of governance, which is why I would say I'm for governance, in the sense that, for God's sake, for some, for some sort of resource that has become so much of value to everyday life, I mean, we sleep, drink, and everything we practically do now, go to school, take care of families and all that, has to do with internet. So somehow, everybody should have some form of say in the way things are being done. So definitely, if you say for or against, I'll say I'm for governance. Okay, <laughs> I'm glad. You know, when you also look at governance, you also look at the other extreme. I'm, I'm one who would stay on the center right, and by that I mean you should definitely be governed, yes. But not governed to the extent that you're controlling the internet. I mean, that's why I just wanted to quickly say it because I don't want to be misunderstood. Definitely, I mean, not, not talking of preference now, in, in the WSIS process, Water and Information Society, was very glaring that one of the things that everybody agreed with was the fact that multi-stakeholder partnerships was the way to go. And speaking of that, you're talking of international organization, to speaking of United Nations agencies, you know, on that line, you're talking of civil society organizations, talking of private sector organizations, and you're talking of government. So what, what my take is, is that everybody should have a say, and not at every level. The technical issues that people can take care of, the legal issues that can be taken care of, but in terms of management and structures and who has a say on what is exactly done at the end of the day, I think everybody should have a pair in a pie. I mean, a share in the pie. Okay. Definitely. I think the structure that may work best will be, I mean, you have to also understand that contextual interpretations will come in here. For example, in Nigeria, when you say internet governance in Nigeria, the first thing that comes to mind is access. People want to have access. They really don't care who's in charge of what first. So definitely there will be some you know, step down levels where you say that each country should be able to say what exactly goes on. But when it comes to global issues, when it comes to the country level domain, of course the country has a say. But when it comes to global issues like you know, fighting scam, like um, talking of access and multilingualism, then I think that every country should have equal representation, should have equal say. Nothing like the Security Council where somebody has veto power and all of that. I mean, those are things that are gone with the past, definitely. I mean, not, not with the age of the internet. Uh, well, first of all, I'll say there's a language monopoly at the moment. I mean, you've heard people say it informally that English is the language of the internet, and I think that is very unfair, because in that sense, it means my grandmother is cut off from the internet, and that's, I think that is stupid, to be blunt about it, because the, the, the truth is, everybody, if we say we have access to human rights, I mean, all of us, then it means that everybody should have a right to express themselves in whatever language they want to, and in whatever way. We have to give credit to organizations like ICANN, to countries like the US for making things come to be. But it's, it's like giving birth to a child, you can thank the parents, but in the growth of the child, you need to get you know, the grade one to 12 or whatever, primary school, secondary school, and all that, all the teachers take you know, care of the child. So it's the same thing. Maybe the parents have been one or two countries that were involved at the beginning and some organizations that were involved, but now the child is growing up and the child will need more than attention, more than the attention it gets from the parents. We need from the teachers, we need from you know, religious organizations and all. Before the one minute, I'll first say this. <laughs> um, at times, when we say things are complex, it's because we've stayed away from them. The things that we call the most complex in life are the things that, when you study them, happen to be quite simple and a lot simpler than we always assumed. If I had one minute on CNN or any other you know, news network, uh, of course I understand what he said here in any way, it's you know, wide coverage. But if I had a minute, what I would say is that at the end of the day, the focus of all this should not be in the technology itself or in profit that can be made, but it should be about people 
and about development. I mean, I work with the civil society, so that's why in this explains my stance. But beyond that, I come from a continent where people are not exactly empowered, as it were. Of course, the fault can be given many other, you know, many dimensions. But the truth is, people need access. What I pay every month for internet access, for bandwidth that is not even half what you get, for example, maybe seven times or 18 times what you pay. So at the end of the day, I would say that the focus, of course, should be on people and development. And, you know, we should rather, yes, the technologies, the technical issues and all that, but the focus should be, at the end of the day, how can we ensure that the gap that already exists, there's economic divide, there's digital divide, social and all that, how can we ensure that the internet as a tool is able to bridge this divide and bring people to come to terms with the opportunities they can also get? So that the young, you know, the, the student in Peru, the student in Nigeria, the student in Ghana, the student in, you know, in the United States, the student in Canada can all have access to the same opportunities. And in 25 years, in 20 years down the line, when things, you know, when we now say, okay, let's have a congress of the whole world, it won't be unfair that the student from Nigeria and the student from Peru are minus 30 and the student from Canada is plus 36. That would be uneven. So people and development, not exactly technology and profit. As things are the moment, I think the greatest fear of networks, um, I'm into movies, so um, my, my fear comes from a couple of movies I've seen, and I'm also, I do a lot of writing, um, fiction stuff, and one of the stories I've written was about how a terrorist network was able to hijack control of the internet, and for a moment, everybody had to, sort of, you know, so to speak, had to consent so the terrorist network, you know, taking charge of all the things they need and all that. And it sounds fictitious, but at the end of the day, I would say that the way the internet is, it's all about balancing freedom and maybe not control in terms of control, freedom and governance. People, one side of the divide is saying, we want to have access, we want to have freedom and do whatever we want to do. But the other side is saying, hey, watch it, freedom can be abused. So. My fear is in the abuse of that freedom. We're already seeing it, you know, um, child molestation, and that's of course our topic in the US now. Uh, various issues, how people can hijack freedom in the name of freedom in itself and misuse that freedom. That's, that's my biggest fear, basically. It could be for violence, it could be for anything, but hijacking freedom. I'll say it again, access number one, access number two, access number three. At the moment, it's unfair the way things are. For example, for the African continent, there's, there's this issue with an average service provider paying both for the traffic originating from his network and traffic terminating on his network, and that, I think, is very unfair. Um, the African ICE Association made some proposition earlier called the halfway proposition theory, where we are saying that, okay, fine, if I'm transmitting between myself and you, we should share the cost. So I would say that one strong area where people need to focus on is in the cost of access, which, of course, moves on to the reach of access. One of the things I intend to talk about um, during the panel on the 2nd of November here, during the Emerging Issues panel, is to say that very clearly, Maybe the MDGs has become a very strong reference point for us in the world to say that every country in a way is under pressure to say by 2015, you know, reduce poverty by half and all that. Maybe we need to redefine MDGs and have point number nine and say that we have universal access for every child, maybe by 2025 or something. You know, so that sounds quite radical, like what he's talking about, but as a truth, I mean, it's, it's unfair for a child who grows up, for example, in Lagos, and the other child who grows up in another country, and for them to have uneven access. Because at the end of the day, they're going to compete for the same jobs. Nobody competes for jobs in country anymore. It's the best guy who can get the job. So should he have a disadvantage because he grew up somewhere else? He didn't choose where he was going to be born. So why deprive him of the opportunity of being a global player? Can I use an iPhone between the two words? Hyphen away. Hyphen away. Okay, equal opportunities, basically. Equal opportunities. All right. Thank you so much. Pleasure, Ismael.